actually not Chris Brody, um, but um, Chris has been called to another urgent meeting, um, actually to discuss the terms of reference for the LEP review. So we thought it was very important that he was there, but he will be joining the meeting later on. So, but in the meantime, you have, have me uh, to put up with. So I'll be chairing today's meeting. So just welcome to you all. Amy, can I check whether there are uh, any um, apologies for the meeting? Sure. So, uh, as you've already mentioned, we have apologies from Chris Brody. Um, we also have apologies from Councillor Glazier, and we have Councillor Simmons here as a substitute. And we also have apologies from Aideen Sadler. Thank you, Amy. Um, so, obviously, the meeting is being recorded as per normal, and obviously, please stick to the normal rules of engagement for Zoom. So, please put yourselves on mute when you're not speaking. Um, and if you uh, want to speak, please use either the raise hand function or wave your hand uh, so I can see it and I will come to you, try to call you in order, um, in the order that I see you raise your hands. So please try not to use the chat function if possible um, for any items that are material um, to the discussion as they aren't public, publicly accessible and we must be really transparent in the meeting. If we're going to move to votes, we'll ask people to um, lower their raised hands between consecutive votes so that we're crystal clear on numbers of each of votes for each item. So thank you. So let's move on to item two, which is the minutes declarations of interest and matters arising. Um, so are there any comments on the uh, record breakingly uh, brief minutes of the 29th of January Freeport's meeting? No, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll seek agreement that they're an accurate record of the meeting. And um, obviously, it's really um, delightful to note that uh, two of the two Freeports were successful. So that's Freeport East and Thames Freeport. Um, and I think that's a really important reflection of how um, the CELEP area is really the UK's international gateway. Um, so I think it's a, a very good success story for us. And congratulations to to those people involved in that bid. If I could ask for declarations of interest, um, and just to remind you, it's really important if you haven't kept, keep up your register of interest um, up to date, um, do talk to Amy or Suzanne if you need any help on that. But are there any um, declarations of interest for today's meeting? Karen? Sorry, it's Karen Cox here. Sorry, I'm not sure if you can see yes, me. Yes, sorry. Yes. Um, so, don't, don't worry. so um, as uh, I have an interest in item six, because the docking station, which is a project we're involved with through the University of Kent, is on the Getting Building Fund Pipeline project list. Great. Thank you. Any others? No? OK, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of... Um, items, um, matters of matters arising. Um, so the first one is about the evolution of the LEPs, um, and this is obviously a really key item at the moment. As I said, that's why Chris is not here at today's meeting. So can I just ask Adam to kind of present how the review of the LEPs is going to happen? And I just want to emphasize before I hand over to Adam that this is about evolution, not extinction. Um, and I think that's really important to note. So, Adam. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Amy, could you put my first slide up, please? Oh, this is just too slick. Thank you. Um, so I just I'm happy to share these slides after the meeting. I just wanted to put all board members exact bring them bring you exactly up to date on on where government are with um, what they initially called a LEP project. And for reasons relating to my own sanity, I've refused to call it let review thus far, um, but unfortunately that seems to be the, uh, the the term that's sticking. So, uh, so you probably refer to it as let review, but I, I sincerely hope they come up with a different name. Um, so, as you will have noticed um, at the budget, government published their intention to examine the future role of LEPs, and obviously this relates to the fact that um, certainly the levelling up fund and very possibly. Um, UKSPF are both capital funding programs in the main that um, won't necessarily have a man well won't have an, a mandated role for LEPs, um, which obviously means that we will that really does bring about a different role moving forward. Um, so 
that's been recognised, and and as a result of that, that a vision for this future role is is currently taking shape in conversations between the LEP network at a national level, um, and the the joint department, so the Citizen Local Growth Unit, which is obviously supported by MHCLG and Bayes. Um, the LEP network is represented by its board. Chris Brody is a member of that board, and obviously he's had a few conversations this week to progress that. Um, so the, the the stages of that process are, to, and I'll get onto this, I suppose, but th there will be a terms of reference that will be shared at some point soon. Um, and then subsequent to that, we expect those conversations to take up place over the over the course of the next few months with an answer by just ahead of summer recess the the way in which it's coming together is i think government are looking to try to establish what the focus for leps should be so um you know there's been talk thus far about um about around skills around human investment around innovation around business support you know all of those things are undertaken variously by leps obviously some leps don't do some of those things indeed we don't do all of those things on that list um so i think that where that gets to a national level will be very interesting but i think it's going to be very important to make sure that we have a good deal of consistency across leps in terms of what we do and obviously you know a very um clear uh, perimeter of you know what are the things that leps do and leps don't do um I think what government have recognised as being very important is the business influence that LEPs bring to bear. Um, and, you know, if anything, they will want to see that strengthened through this process. Sarah's already said that um, this is about evolution. Um, and actually, you know, a lot of our colleague organisations or the LEPs have been, have been very positive about um, the, the changes that might be brought about by this process, which is good. Form follows function is something else that um, has been a, a, a sort of watchword coming from the centre and really that's that relates to, you know, the the nature of those activities that LEP do, that LEPs do moving forward, how it best sits, how it maps across functional economic areas and how government address issues, particularly those that have come about with um, some of the MCA areas, the mayoral combined authority areas elsewhere in the country, where the relationship between the, the LEP or the business board and the MCA has become fairly messy. So that's something that they're looking at. There is also a somewhat of an informal recognition that 38 units is, is a few too many. So not that I, that I think this will be black and white in the terms of reference, but we get the impression that having fewer laps will be the direction of travel rather than anything else. Um, another thing to note really is that this is, as we said at the beginning, this is a result of policy change rather than any um, assessment of overall performance of laps or the performance of any particular laps. Um, and that point is going to be made quite clear in the terms of reference I'm very much led to believe. Amy, if I can have my next slide, please. Um, so as I've said, very very live indeed the development of that those terms of reference um in, you know happening right now and um, has taken our, our chair away from this meeting um the interesting I, I guess the dynamic in terms of the lep network is one of recognizing that um bays have been particularly supportive of leps of late so quasi quarteng is um, an advocate of what we do um, and I think some, some of that is reflected in, in those conversations that have happened at that national level. Um, I think the message to us, without repeating some of the stuff that I've already said and moving on to the third bullet point, the message to us absolutely is about continuing to deliver strongly. I think we've probably got more to do as this year than, than a lot of LEPs. Our, our agenda is quite big. We've got, you know, we've still got a sizable chunk of our capital programme to deliver across the patch. So we will be busier than ever which is good and i think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we that we continue to deliver strongly and do that good job that i hope that you all recognize that we do which really leads me on to the last point and um around the importance of people in all of this which is a point that the chair of the lep network has made at a national level um you know it's all very well you know lots of people out there having conversations around what local growth might look like moving forward but I think, and certainly for me, the primary consideration has got to be just having a bit of respect for some of the officers involved, having some recognition of the impact that conversations like this have on, on people whose job it is to do this stuff. So um, 
that certainly is my primary consideration in, in all conversations around this. Um, and I think you can you can probably discern from what I've said already that you know I've got every reason to to be positive um, in terms of what we've heard, but inevitably this will bring some degree of change um, to to what we deliver and and how we're structured to deliver to deliver that as well. Um, we will of course keep you fully up to date with everything that we hear, um, and uh, I think that'll that'll start to move pretty pretty rapidly over the course of the following uh, over, mm. over the next couple of months. So that's that's more or less everything that we know. Obviously, there, there are new things happening all the time. When we get anything more concrete, we'll we'll put it across to the board. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you, Adam. Okay, does, unless there are any other questions, Roger, go. On. Thank you. Just checking, I wasn't on mute. Um, Adam, it's interesting the point about size of LEPs. I mean, we're already at the, this, this LEP is already a pretty large one. Is, is there any sense you have above and beyond what you've set out in the presentation as to what sort of scale of change we might be looking at? I don't mean necessarily specifically for us, but uh, more in terms of how much change nationally in terms of numbers, which might then have a knock-on effect on us. I haven't, beyond what I've said, uh, Roger, I haven't heard really anything. I, th I think Chris has, has got the impression from the conversations he's been involved in that they want to work with fewer than 38 laps. And a lot of the conversations have been about regional type approaches, which, to be honest, lend themselves more to sizes like ours than they do to some of the really small laps that exist already. So if, you know, if, to follow that logic, I suppose if, if there are going to be changes and the numbers are going to be brought down a little bit, then we'd probably be unlikely to be affected by it um, mm. as much as other areas that we've got really quite small outfits. Um, sure. But I mean, certainly I don't know anything more than what I've said, and um, I suppose it'd be wrong to speculate. Thanks a lot, Adam. Thank you. It's an ever-evolving picture. Rodney Chambers and then Graham Buttons. Um, thank you, Adam, for that um, um, presentation, because um, there is a lot of chatter in the um, area about what the future is um, going to be. Um, I think the success of the South East LEP is, has hinged around the way we've uh, dealt with um, the, and delivered the funding opportunities through the capital programme and also the Growing Places Fund and the Better Building Fund. I think probably not a LEP that has actually performed and got the money out in, in, a, uh, in a way as efficient as um, this LEP has working in partnerships with its um, constituent um, bodies. Um, but what I want to know is, 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 there, is there likely to be any further capital programs or the questions need to be asked in the discussions what is the government's um, aim as far as uh, any possible uh, future capital um, uh, programs being delivered through the, um, uh, the the lets in whatever form they emerge and also from our own perspective and I think other lets would be asking this same question we do have the Graham Places Fund which is a revolving fund now, is the government going to say, well, we're going to, it might have been revolving and it came from us and then we let you turn it into a revolving fund. But is they, are they going to say, well, we'll take that back um, as well? I mean, there are a number of uh, questions that I've got regarding financing. And then there's the other one. We get significant resourcing from the government on a year on basis to actually, if you like, run the show. And what's the government's attitude that going to be? Because I remember the old days, I used to serve on um, CIRA and the, it was almost, the government created it and it then expected the local authorities to put in the contributions. And of course, the, the, there were quite a lot across the Southeast area to actually resource it. Uh, and I want to know what the government's expectations um, would be um, uh, post um, restructuring uh, the LEPs. 
Thank you, Rodney. Before I bring Adam in, there, I, I'm just going to say that I think these are all really good questions, all questions which we are asking at the moment, um, to which we don't have any clarity on the answers. But is there anything else you want to add to that, Adam? Uh, I was just going to say every, every question that Rodney's listed there are questions that we're asking as well. I mean, important for me is going to be um, the, the function moving forward, because if it's not going to relate to capital funding programmes beyond this coming year, then, you know, looking at it from a sell perspective, if we have a body of work defined for us, it, of course, has to be a body of work that makes sense. And that people can support us undertaking. So, you know, there is um, there's a lot to there's a lot to work through. But certainly, on some of the specifics, that there's there's certainly no basis for government to ask for the return of Growing Places Fund, for example. So we can, you know, continue to revolve that. Um, so you know, none of that will would be at risk of going back. Um, I think government will probably learn a few lessons from how the Leveling Up Fund works over the coming weeks, for example. Um, and, and they'll be able to sort of draw a comparison between how that goes and how, say, the, the Getting Building Fund has gone, working with LEPs. You know, I'm sure some things will be better, some things will be more difficult. Um, all questions that we're asking. Um, and, you know, we're, we're really unclear as to, you know, the direction of travel on some of that. Thank you. Um, Graham Butland and then Joe James. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I don't think we should be under any illusions that this review is taking place in a vacuum. Um, I think this is part of a much wider plan. Um, the answer I understand is 27. Um, and I think it's important. Uh, there's some inter been some interesting things recently, the way certain uh, resources have suddenly gone out through local authorities and not LEPs, etc. So I wouldn't want people to think that it is just uh, LEPs that are under scrutiny. Um, I think we might well see later this year, some really significant changes to the way in which this country is governed. Thank you. Jo James. Um, you know, I think my concern really comes on to, you know, how do we hold on to the excellent team that we've got amidst all this sort of continued uncertainty? It's very unsettling for them. And, you know, job security is really important, probably more so because of the current economic climate. So, you know, we, we've got an excellent team. We know that and we need to ensure while we're going through this process that actually we can still mm -hmm. retain them. So, you know, wherever possible um, or whoever can, we need to ensure that we're, we're putting the pressure to get the decision for the future, mm -hmm. what the future looks like as soon as possible. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with that, Joe. And, and one of the reasons why we've all been promised an answer before the summer is to address so we can sort of address some of those concerns as quickly as possible um for me that's the the biggest uh, you know there are two things here that that are really important one is keeping the team together and retaining everybody in the way that you've just described another is making sure that we can continue to demonstrate to certainly to the businesses on the board that you know that they're, they play an important role alongside their local authority partners so you know it's it's, it's going to be a difficult one for government to get right, um, but I hope they do. And we're certainly doing all we can to, you know, make the best possible case for what this organisation has delivered in the past. But certainly, um, yeah, on the issue of keeping the team together, I'll certainly do do everything I can. And you know, I would emphasise to any any individual in the team listening to me now that, you know, they shouldn't feel concerned. Um, in a way that they might have done, you know, maybe six weeks ago when some of the early coverage came out. You know, this absolutely is about the evolution uh, of the LEP and, you know, that's, that can only be a positive thing. Thank you. And I, I, again, just to emphasise, I agree, Joe. it's a really important point and I think it's a really important point for us as, as board members of CELEP to continue to consider how we look after um, our people in the best possible way um, and support them in the best possible mm -hmm. way because they have done the most amazing job you've seen how they're kind of working through all of these capital programs as, as Rodney mentioned you know with extraordinary um, uh, speed and uh, but but continued uh, detail uh, detailed work so yeah I just want to absolutely pay tribute to all of our staff and to say just re-emphasize that this is evolution 
and out of it there could come some really interesting things too so um, for every challenge there is always an opportunity um, so I think we need to think about it in, in that way as much as possible. A little bit odd. Um, I'll, I'll close that matter, but come on to the, another matter arising, Perry. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Sarah. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've been asked today to uh, make uh, report the following very sad news uh, to the board of the passing on the 11th of March of David March and the chief exec of Castle Point uh, after a short, uh, very short illness. David Marchand made a huge impact during just under 16 years as the chief exec of Castle Point Borough Council, most notably leading the transformation of the council from one of the worst performing councils in the country to one of the best. Beyond Castle Point, David Marchand was the longest serving chief executive in Essex and is held in very high regard by councillors and colleagues across Essex particularly in South Essex and within local government where he served for over 40 years. Uh, I certainly knew him on a professional basis for a number of years and I know a lot of you dealt with uh, David, knew David personally. He'll sadly be missed by all of us and our thoughts are with his family and friends today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Perry. Yes, indeed, our thoughts um, will, are with him and with his family. Okay, so I'd like to... I don't think we're getting you, Sarah, all the time. I don't know, Adam, whether you want to pick up the, while Sarah sorts a line out. I was just about to. Thanks, Perry. Are you back, Sarah? Uh, I'm hopefully back, but <laughs> that doesn't mean you need I'm to shout back. shout through the door and tell everybody to get off the internet in your house. I do. I do. I don't, I don't know why. So, but I was going to hand over to you anyway on this item. So, so let me on item three. So, can I do that now, please? Of course. Thank you. So. Um, Item three, we are due to discuss um, the appointment of directors um, and the confirmation statement. We are going to split this item into two, um, purely for on the basis that Chris, as chairman, wanted to be present for the discussion around the appointment of co-opted posts for the coming financial year. Um, co-opted uh, board members so um, we will we'll cover some of it because uh, one of the items certainly relates to uh, one of our, one of our normal uh, board member attendees and we're keen to get him back into the to the meeting as soon as we can um, so I'll hand over to Suzanne to cover to cover that element of the paper and we'll revisit the rest of it when Chris is back thank you Adam um, so, yeah, there's two points that we're going to cover off now um, on the agenda. The first will be um, a uh, to ask you to consider the resolution to make Ron Woodley a permanent director of CELEP. And the second, um, as it's um, a fairly mundane point of business, we thought we'd cover off the confirmation statement now and um, have that out of the way. So um, for Ron, so um, I'm sure um, lots of us know, Ron, um, when CELEP Limited was um, incorporated last year, the nomination for the permanent director for South End on Sea Borough Council was Councillor Ian Gilbert. Ron has been his deputy and attended a number of meetings. Uh, Councillor Gilbert has now uh, resigned from his post and um, we have a vacancy as per our records at Companies House. South End have nominated Councillor Ron Woodley to be their representative and board is asked whether, uh, asked to consider the resolution to appoint Councillor Ron Woodley as the South End on Sea permanent director. So, um, Chair, perhaps we'll take that decision now. Then, we, if that decision passes, we can invite Ron into the virtual room. Okay, thank you. Perry, you have your hands up. I was voting. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I thought you had a comment before we moved. I thought you were to vote. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Okay, so, so can I see your votes now, please? Uh, uh, 
Okay, Suzanne. Yeah, I think that's uh, unanimous. So, um, Amy, please, could you um, let Ron virtually back into the room? Just give a couple of moments uh, for that to happen because it just takes. Uh, there we go. Um, welcome back, Councillor Woodley. Um, so, the second part that we'll consider now is the confirmation statement. Uh, as set out in the report, we need to make a confirmation statement to Companies House each year to confirm that the information that they are holding is correct. We have checked the information they are holding is correct. There's been no significant changes in the past 12 months other than some changes in directors. The information that we're holding is, um, is in your pack. So I would now ask board to approve the filing of the confirmation statement at Appendix A. Lovely. Thank you very much. And we will get that filed and uh, all registered. And I think that's that's it on this item for me for now. Oh, and just that we're no, we oh. Oh, we need to note the resignation of Councillor Ian Gilbert, effects, effective of the 1st of February 2021. I think that was the only other thing, wasn't it, Suzanne? Yep, yep. Thank you. OK, so as, as Adam said, we will come back to the rest of that item um, later. So now I just want to move on to item four, which is the recovery and renewal strategy. And I'm going to, to hand over to Adam and then, then Sharon in a minute. But before I do that, I just wanted to kind of give you a bit of a context about this strategy. So as you probably remember, the framework was endorsed uh, at the December board meeting um, and the team have been working extraordinarily hard, particular thanks to Helen and Sharon on this, to complete the strategy which was being circulated in your um, board packs. We've previously discussed this, the purpose of the new strategy is to provide a, 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 a more relevant um, strategic framework, sorry someone dropped something in my house, I don't know if you could hear that, um, to guide CELEP working forwards and um, I think it's particularly important that we have this really, uh, the, this strategy at the moment because we've got to use it to continue to influence government and stakeholders about the kind of most critical issues and opportunities that we have for, the, for our economy. So it's really important that I believe that we have an agreed narrative um, and that's particularly important um, apropos the evolution of the LEPs. So I kind of really know there's obviously a great deal of uncertainty as we've discussed previously about the LEPs themselves, but also actually regarding the wider policy and funding landscape, and indeed the kind of longer term impacts of COVID on our economy. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that the priorities that are set out in the strategy are in line with the messages coming out of government. Um, and that they reflect um, the priorities in the, in the last budget and, and the plan for growth. Um, obviously, we need to continue to be agile and we need to continue to adapt and develop um, plans as, as we go forward. So we need to ensure that we are able to continually review and, and develop uh, this, this plan. So with that sort of whistle top stop um, introduction to the plan, I'm gonna hand over now to Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And I'll, I'll hand quickly on to Sharon in a second. But I just, I just wanted to draw a very um, sort of, I guess, basic link between the conversation that we've just had um, and the strategy. I mean, it's, it's very much my take on this. And it's something I reflected to Kent leaders recently. And I would, I would sort of say it to the board too, that um, the framework that this provides is, is really important for us as a team. I think, you know, it, it absolutely builds on what the board's already seen and it obviously builds on strategies that exist um, at a local level too and the good work that came together a year ago for the list. Um, I, I think the focus that it has on short-term deliverables is probably stronger than, than you've seen in previous strategies and I think that's all about making sure that yeah, we deliver strongly this coming year. You know, it, it really does give us that framework to op operate well in. And we fully recognise that with the changes that, that that are likely to come our way, that it might necessitate a different approach, you know, in the future, in the not too distant future. 
but you know i think this gives us a it's still an important step forward and and would give us a good um a good way to build the rest of our activities and obviously from an operational perspective that relates back to the delivery plan into our own um plans as indiv individual staff members and what we're looking to achieve this year to support the agenda um so i won't say more than that um because i'll just fall foul of uh, saying everything that sharon was going to say so i'll hand over to sharon so hopefully people will have received the document with the papers for today's meeting so i wasn't planning to kind of to go through or share this slide at this stage um just really wanted to give you kind of a few headlines around some of the messages and the approach that adam and um, sarah have just alluded to as well um really what's in that document um, that's been shared is a more detailed articulation around the framework that was presented to this board in december so hopefully it shouldn't really be any surprises in terms of um, the content or um, the priorities and areas of focus that are within that document. What we have done is work to take account of the feedback that was discussed at that board meeting and um, before Christmas, and also from a really constructive um, workshop that we had with business members earlier this year. Um, so thank you to all the board members and to some of your wider colleagues that have really helpfully taken the time to contribute in those discussions. As um, we've probably mentioned before, the document does also build on the previous work around the list and all the engagement work that took place as part of that, as well as on the emerging intelligence and activities, obviously, that's happened over the last 12 months. And that's both in terms of building our own kind of select um, evidence space, but also the activities that have been taking place at a federated area, as Adam's just mentioned, and also across all of our working groups to really understand sort of um, the implications and the impacts. Of course, we recognise um, that we're still in a very unique situation in terms of the timing of this strategy. And so we've tried to reflect that and be as responsive to that as possible within the approach. Um, so firstly, as part of that, um, again, I think as Sarah said, it's important that the document very clearly sets out our strategic role and enables us to clearly describe those significant opportunities that we've got across CELIT to support and drive the economic recovery. It focuses in particular on the areas where the LEP can bring added value through a strong collaborative approach. So moving away from just thinking about capital programmes, as has been discussed already today. And hopefully that approach is reflected across all of the four strategic priorities. And so just again, hopefully you've got it in front of you, but just to remind you of those, the priorities are around business resilience and growth, the global gateway, communities for the future and the coastal catalyst. Um, so we know that we do need to demonstrate the impact that we can have through our media actions within the strategy as well. And so that's been highlighted through some of the work that's in train already, for example, around the, de uh, the delivery of the COVID-19 support funds and the Getting Building Fund projects, just as a couple of examples. Um, throughout the document, we've then tried to identify other specific areas that we believe can be progressed in the short term. And some examples around that include the work of the major projects group that's already having discussions around how we can kind of collectively work to address issues around skills, supply chains, future workforce issues and innovation. Um, also interesting discussions around kind of developing research and think pieces around the future of communities and CELEP's role in placemaking as an area where I think there's a real appetite for CELEP to show leadership on those issues. Um, and then also in terms of supporting kind of some of the big policy agendas um, and implications that are coming through, like around the recent announcement of our free ports. In addition, we've suggested the inclusion of some case studies throughout the, the strategy, and those are to both reflect just some examples of the investment and interventions that have been successfully put in place to date, um, as well as some of the significant in initiatives that are either kind of recently underway or are due to be progressed, and again, linked to some of those really kind of exciting strategic opportunities going forward and some of those big things on the government's agenda as well. Um, what we've um, also got within the strategy is just kind of a brief overview of the cellular economy itself. So some of those kind of big facts and figures that many of you are probably already familiar with um, and some of the headlines around the big impacts and challenges that we've seen over the last 12 months. Um, we've kind of brought some presentations around that to previous board meetings and I think it's just to just want to reassure you that that work remains an ongoing and evolving piece of work. So the idea is that we kind of have some head within the strategy, but rather than have a big, long evidence base like we did for the list that quite quickly become out of date, um, we'll use the CELEP website to really kind of continue to build our understanding and provide that information in a more sort of dynamic way so that you can look at things like breakdowns around population, geographies and sectors in a lot more detail. So that work continues alongside the strategy. 
In terms of our longer term ambitions and activities, again, we know that those will obviously be shaped by the outcome of various policy developments as well. Um, and also by the emerging implications from the pandemic, um, both of which are still not completely known at this stage. <clears throat> um, but what we have done um, that we think is really important is to set out um, quite clearly some guiding principles. And these reflect um, some of those issues that have come up quite frequently in discussions at this board meeting and with wider partners around the fundamental things that CELEP really needs to be prioritising and recognising in all of our work and priorities going forward. And those are about how we drive clean growth, how we close the digital divide, which has obviously become even more pertinent over recent months, um, around developing the skills of our workforce and our residents, and around addressing inequalities. So those are kind of cross-cutting throughout the strategy and things that we need to work to, um, to build on going forward. So I hope that you'll see from the document that we have tried to build in um, a level of flexibility to our approach, recognising that some of the detail will continue to be worked through as we move to developing our delivery plan in coming months. I think it's reassuring, though, that from what we've already seen that's come out from, um, from the government's budget announcements and the, re and the associated plan for growth, that the kind of issues they talk through, in, that they highlight in that through the core pillars and issues around global Britain, net zero, levelling up, they're very much in line with the priorities that are set out um, and the principles that are set out in this strategy. So I think the last thing that I just wanted to say was that in producing this document, we do recognise that um, probably the audience is, is, is different this time around. So it's less, the focus is less on government as sort of, you know, the, the key audience than perhaps it was when we were doing the list. Obviously, there's still kind of, it will serve a crucial purpose in terms of communicating our message to government. Um, but our emphasis going forward is really about that voice of business. So I think it's more important than ever that we're able to translate the strategy and our priorities to that business audience. Um, so with that in mind, what we intend to do on sort of our following on from this board meeting is to not to change the content, but to produce a shorter, clearer, refined version that's perhaps more targeted and appealing to that business audience. So that's something that we'll work on kind of post um, comment and endorsement from the board. Obviously happy to take any questions and to hear your feedback. Time, we'd be particularly interested to hear the board's views on kind of key areas that you might like to see prioritised in the sort of, you know in the short term as we move towards focusing on the delivery planning stage of this work. Um, but I'll hand back to Sarah for that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So um, I saw Carol board right raise her thumbs at the comment of making sure that there is a very um, business friendly version of this document. And I think that was something that was fed back at our, our um, meeting um, when we discussed the strategy. So I think that's really important. So other board members do, Karen, do you have your hand up or is that an old hand? Apologies, oh. old hand. Okay, thank you. Are there other comments or queries? I can't see any. So good. Okay, so um, do we agree uh, to adopt the Seller Economic Recovery and Renewal Strategy, Appendix A, as the overarching strategy for Seller? If adopted, this strategy will supersede the existing economic strategy and will set the LEP strategic direction and focus and be used as the basis for all future prioritizations of funding allocations. Do, can I see your hands on that, please? Thank you. Thank you um, all. And uh, thank you to the team for all your work on that. And I look forward to kind of it continuing to evolve and develop. And um, Perry, did you have your hand up and you had a comment? Yeah, yeah I did, uh, Sarah. Sorry. I just, I just wondered whether we uh, would want to extend this decision to provide this document being a basis for, for providing support to bids and proposals being brought forward by partners across the CELEC. And I'm, sp I'm thinking here local authorities where they're promoting projects through emerging funding sources where they're aligned with the aims of the strategy. So I thought just, just to sort of extend that decision to, uh, to, for, for that reason. Do board members agree with that? Can I see your hands uh, on that if you do, please?
Great. Thank you, Perry, for that really useful suggestion. OK, let's move on now to item five, which is a skills report. I'm going to hand over to Louise um, on this. But um, I, as you know, um, the Department for Education requested a skills report from the, uh, the CELEP skills advisory panel by the end of March. Um, and, and this is what she's going to um, talk to you about. I have to say that the skills advisory board um, really kicks well above its weight and delivers some incredible things. And I'd like to pay tribute particularly to Louise for all of the work that she does on this. I know nationally it is regarded, we are regarded as a real force for change and good in the skills arena. So thank you to Louise and to all of the skills advisory group. But Louise, let me hand over to you now, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That's really kind of you. And it's it's really credit to all of the amazing partners we're working with. We're very, very lucky, I think, to have such a um, collaborative um, group. I'm going to um, talk through a bit about the skills report and also what we're doing, because the skills report itself includes that. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, so if you could let me know when you can see the presentation, that would be great. Um, it's been a while. You can probably see my messy desktop at the moment. Can you see that OK? Yes, we can. Brilliant. Um, OK, so I just wanted to first take you back because um, uh, back in the um, kind of 2018, we took a skill strategy to the board or and that was back in High House um, when we were allowed to meet in person. So I just thought it was worth reflecting on the fact that this uh, incorporates all of that work. And actually, it's been a really useful exercise for us in terms of revisiting that and making sure that we're delivering against it. That at the time was published. It had a lot of evidence sitting behind it and, and actually it put us in a really good position um, when the Department for Education invited all LEPs to set up skills advisory panels. So again, we were very lucky that there were pre-existing um, federated skills boards that we were able to work with in setting that up. But it gave us a really good um, basis in terms of the geography and the sectors that we felt should be represented on that uh, skills advisory panel, very much employer led. That is chaired by um, Helen Clements of Morgan Sindel, previously chaired by Colette Bailey of Metal. Um, Angela sits as the vice chair and there is a sort of sister group, if you like, um, our skills working group, which um, brings together the colleges, local authorities um, and universities across the area. Um, but we've been able to pull together a really strong group. We've recently added uh, Job Centre Plus because we felt that that was important in the context of all the initiatives that are out there at the moment. Um, and we also receive funding from the Department for Education. So we've been able to uh, produce quite a lot of research um, and I'll come on to some of the things that we've been able to do. So they're just, it's just a snapshot of um, the sort of organisations that are involved. And in terms of what that panel is already doing, it's already really reaching out very widely. Um, a lot of the employers that are on the panel are already engaging in the skills network. So they're already, for example, enterprise advisors, STEM ambassadors, they're engaging in careers and work experience. Helen, um, who you can see there, um, our chair does an awful lot of work in things like virtual work experience and working with schools and colleges and that kind of thing. The engagement um, and the reach of the, the panel is already very high. So the, this is just a sort of image of um, an online event we had in October 2020. So we were keen not to be deterred by COVID. We were due to have a, an in-person event um, in the autumn. And so we went ahead with a, a virtual conference and we had over 230 people attending and really good feedback. And actually that also enabled us to bring together the work of the Digital Skills Partnership. So there you can see um, Debbie Forster, who's a really good speaker from um, Tech Talent Charter. Um, and it enabled us to have a, a talk about what we're doing against the skills strategy. That, that is still available if anyone is interested in, in viewing it. So in terms of the skills report itself, all um, skills advisory panels have been asked to produce these, as Sarah said, by the end of March. Um, so we've already shared the uh, draft version. Hopefully you've had a chance to look through. I realise it's quite long. Um, there's probably some parts that are maybe more of interest than others. And there's also a huge big um, annex and evidence base that sits with it. So it's been a good opportunity for us to update some of the data. 
We've already had feedback from the Department for Education on the first version because they wanted to see an earlier version and they're happy with, with the content, just had a few suggestions which we've incorporated and some kind of rejigging of, of the order of things. Uh, the Skills Advisory Panel and Skills Working Group have both also endorsed it and we've incorporated comments from them which have been very gratefully received. Um, but it's, it's, although it's been obviously quite a mission to produce, it's also been a really useful exercise. So it's been a chance for us to set out our case studies, progress, action plan and forward look and just have a, a relook um, at the strategy, particularly through the lens of COVID uh, and also to look at any barriers that we're still facing. So that report will feed into the National Skills and Productivity Board and central government. And it's also referenced in the Skills for Job white paper. And we've had on the white paper, we've had a statement from the DfE to include in the report and, and quite a lot of reassurances as to the importance of skills advisory panels and of, of this report uh, in the delivery of the white paper. Um, <clears throat> and I attended a meeting with DfE on Monday um, and the LEP network at which we were able to set out our strong partnership approach. And I think that was a very constructive discussion. So in terms of our revisiting the um, skill strategy, we had an original vision and priorities that we've been working against. So everything we do um, across skills delivers against this. We, we felt, I won't read all of this out because obviously you're able to do that, um, but we felt revisiting this that everything remained very current, um, but we've added in, in red, we've added green and diverse because we feel that they're important areas for us to build into our ambition, um, but it's still really important for us to increase apprenticeships and industry relevant qualifications, still seeking to simplify the landscape, uh, wanting to build an inclusive economy and raise awareness of jobs and growth. So <clears throat> everything we said um, a couple of years ago remains very relevant. And we've also had a look at some of the specifics um, and particularly looking at the impact of COVID and whether these are still relevant. Um, so this just sets out some of those and our, our kind of exercise of looking at whether they're still priorities. Um, so our skills levels do still fall below the national average and our um, kind of regional counterparts. And um, obviously that's an area we, we want to see improve, but the gap has closed. So the positive thing is skills levels have increased um, and the gap has closed slightly with the national average. Um, and, and it's worth noting, obviously, there's great disparity across the area. So all the data we're producing, we're also going to be producing at district level. Um, also, we have huge numbers of people with no qualifications and um, as has been well versed and documented, our out of work benefits have seen a big increase. So um, obviously an area of priority is ensuring we help people get back into the sectors that are still recruiting. Um, our earnings still tend to sort of be below our counterparts and the national average um, and apprenticeship numbers, of, of, as colleagues know, have seen a, a recent decline. So there's a whole host of things that we still need to do and that still remain current and priorities. Uh, in terms of what we've already done and are doing against those, um, just some headlines. So over 69 million now um, investment in facilities and that includes some of the recent funding as well. And that's in skills facilities. So that's in our colleges, universities. Um, so, you know, really sort of a, a lot of investment there into the having the appropriate um, kit and buildings and that kind of thing. We've also now had over 80 million pounds of European social funding uh, delivering against our priorities and supporting people into and in work to progress. Um, we have a number of new programmes starting to deliver across the patch, so we'll be putting together a summary of those soon. Uh, and we've also been successful in a bid to the D Department for Work and Pensions for two million pounds worth of uh, European social funding to put a call out for pathways to employment for young people. Uh, which is a, a bit of a win really because the door is now closed for using ESF reserve fund locally. Um, it's now only available to extend existing programmes. So we're looking forward to seeing that translate into actual programmes on the ground. And, and as I said, the evidence and research remains really important. We're building that up all of the time. We've had really increased volume of requests for data research through COVID for obvious reasons. People want to see what the impact has been. So we're continuing to make that as available as possible. 
Um, and we've got things like our tutor bursary programme that are delivering against the shortage of tutors that was highlighted in the skills strategy. And we also, in the skills strategy, put in an ambition to be a digital skills partnership area. And of course, as, as colleagues know, we were successful in our bid. And we've now, we've just had year three confirmation funding from the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. So we will be um, moving into a year three of our digital skills partnership. Um, the, the DSP would need a whole um, separate presentation but I just wanted to flag a couple of highlights and examples of what it's already doing at the moment so this is a, a conference that's happening on the 25th of March around um, shifting the gender gap in computing education that we're leading on with um, or really STEM learning are leading on it in their capacity of work for the Digital Skills Partnership. Um, I think nearly 100 teachers have signed up already and board members would be very welcome. We've got a VIP invitation if you would like to join um, any or part of that to get an insight into what the um, Digital Skills Partnership is doing. And that's just one example. Uh, there are also Google Digital Garages delivering at the moment with over a thousand registrations having been received. Um, and that's for SMEs, charities and entrepreneurs. So some great stuff happening. Um, in terms of our looking forward, we, we set out in the original skills strategy, our ambition to work with big projects. And um, as Sharon said, there is a major projects group now and we've actually set up a subgroup, so a skills group. Um, there's been real appetite from the projects themselves for us to do this, which is just brilliant. Um, and we're meeting again next month. We have had an initial meeting um, and really, really positive. Um, and we're in the process of commissioning a report that will help us to look at the skills needs across these projects um, and to look at maybe where there's pinch points where you know you might need a thousand welders all at the same time for example um, so we're going to be able to have a bit more of a detailed look but that should also serve as a useful document for us to share locally because there's a lot of again appetite for this sort of information and we feel that they're quite good hooks um, to showcase the sectors they represent. So uh, sectors like construction and engineering have shortages. And these are great hooks for us to engage um, schools and, and, and other audiences in the job opportunities that are coming through. And in, in the kind of context of raising awareness, um, we have established a South East Skills website um, and huge thanks to colleagues in our comms team, um, Zoe and Ellie as well, who've done a, a lot of work in helping us to get this up and running. Um, but this really came about because we felt we had so much information that we'd like to share through the skills advisory panel and the digital skills partnership. So we've now got all of that kind of labor market information, uh, resources, things like digital courses, added to that and it's very much a resource for the area where we can sh share reports, news, that kind of thing. Uh, and it includes an apprenticeship se section. So delivering against our ambition to increase apprenticeships, we put a call out during National Apprenticeship Week for um, colleagues, so whether it's apprentices, employers or providers to share their experiences just on their mobile phones or in any way they, they wanted to. And we were inundated. It was just brilliant. Um, so we've got a whole library now. We shared uh, quite a lot of these through National Apprenticeship Week, but we've got a whole library of uh, really brilliant stories of, of what apprenticeships are delivering across the area and, and how they're helping with our kind of economic growth. And the, the website also, as I said, we're looking to break information down as far as possible. So we've got district information and we'll be adding to that. So um, that's being really, really well received locally. And in terms of going forward um, and, and delivering against the action plan that hopefully you've had chance to look at, there's quite a comprehensive action plan we're go going to be delivering. A few highlights are that we, one of our action plan ambitions was to be an established partner to test um, areas of national policy. And um, the Digital Skills Partnership is a great example of that. It remains one of only, I think, seven or eight in the country. Um, so it's still a really, really positive thing for us to have. And we're working with um, the DWP and Cornwall Let on a, a potential health and wellbeing pilot in the area, um, which I think would be really positive and enable us to, to move forward in that area of work. We're also about to launch the remaining 
skills COVID recovery fund. So there's still 375,000 of that to procure that was agreed for the innovative new solutions um, to training barriers. Uh, we're also planning a careers event on the 15th of July um, in, in terms of uh, sharing our growth areas and, and the opportunities that exist. And we've agreed with the skills advisory panel that we should hold a series of webinars on things like the future of jobs and automation and the impact that's having on different sectors. Um, and we'll continue to raise the profile of apprenticeships. So we had a panel and Q&A session during National Apprenticeship Week, which was really successful and would look to do more of that kind of thing. And of course, also working with the existing landscape. So everything like the, the Restart programme government are about to launch, retraining scheme, kickstart. It's really important that we engage in those things um, and work with partners and also encourage employers to join in with things like um, STEM ambassadors, enterprise advisors and governors. Um, so not to reinvent any wheels and to, to maximise those. Um, and we feel an area, a potential area for us to expand on is encouraging participation in schemes such as Disability Confident and to continue to work with industry bodies. So I just thought I'd show you the image of um, a potential platform we'll be using for the virtual, we, we haven't come up with the final name yet, but a virtual skills festival. Um, and in, as we're in the online world still, um, this will be a great way for us to reach as many people as possible, for employers to have stands, for people to walk around those stands virtually um, and to go into an auditorium. So we're really excited. We're working, again, this will be very much a partnership effort. Um, we've had a lot of support and offers of support uh, in the planning of this so we're really looking forward to starting to kind of plan it in more detail and, and share the detail with you all and in terms of the timeline for the skills report um, we've kind of this sets out where we, where we are in the stage so we're, we're obviously hoping we get your sign off today um, and then we would be finalizing and, and posting it on our websites um, and then DFE will also publish and, and provide a link through to that so um, all LEPs will then have their their reports published that will then become um, an annual report um, and rather confusingly the next version of it will be in November um, so the November version will be a refresh and we'll then refresh it every every November uh, and if we get uh, hopefully you'll sign off today. I was going to propose that we include a, a statement from Chris and Sarah on your behalf, just to note that we have had that endorsement. Um, and one of our ambitions is to, to strengthen the links between the skills advisory panel and yourselves. So that would be quite a nice um, way to start doing that. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Hopefully I haven't run over time. No, I mean, uh, thank you, Louise. I mean, it just shows what an amazing body of work that you are delivering and you and, and the advisory group um, and, and just want to reiterate my tribute to you and to the advisory group. And I, th I think it's, I agree completely with you that it's really important that we work closely with, with you all on that. So do board members have any comments or queries for Louise? Thank you. OK, so we, we are asked to note the update on the skills activities of the LEP and, and the progress against the skills strategy and approve the CELEP uh, SAP skills report for submission to the Department of Education by the 31st of March 2021 deadline. Sorry, Perry, you've got your hand. Oh, no, no, it isn't. You didn't have your hand up. That was an old hand, was it? And it just went down. Thank you. OK. Uh, Thank you. OK, so are we do we approve that, please? Great. Thank you very much. OK, so now we're going over to, to Rhiannon, who's going to go through the Getting Building Fund pipeline. Rhiannon. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so Getting Building Fund, we're obviously awarded £85 million over the summer. Uh, of last year and we've been really successful in, in being able to approve 35 projects for that funding um, and 42.5 million pounds is due to be transferred to the authorities uh, in by the end of next week in effect so you know over half of that funding is already out the door which is really good news. There was one project that couldn't proceed uh, which means we've currently got uh, 1.019 million pounds getting building fund that's unallocated um, obviously, it's a relatively small amount of funding. So what we've done over the last few months 
is uh, work with local areas to identify some potential investments um, to use that funding. The second part of it is also then establishing a pipeline of projects. So if other projects are unable to proceed, we've got those projects in line with you know, business cases prepared and ready to go um, so we can reallocate funding very quickly. Um, and just to remind board members, the deadline for spending this funding is uh, this time next year. So we've only got a year left to actually you know, spend all of this funding. It, they're very much kind of quick wins that we're looking for here to be able to demonstrate we can you know, invest in jobs, but also get the funding um, spent as well. So we had uh, 10 projects that came forward as eligible. Uh, those considered by the federated areas um, and identified for investment. Um, of those 10 projects, eight of them were considered eligible. There were two that weren't considered eligible um, due to issues around planning um, and also you know, the ability to spend within this very short time scale. Um, of those eight projects that are then eligible, we've scored and assessed those with you know, consideration for firstly the deliverability but also that federated area assessment that's happened as well. That has been brought together a kind of total score for the projects and the top few projects on that list are therefore uh, the Princess Alexander Hospital, the Charleston Access Road and Innovation Park Medway. Those projects all had a, a very similar score. What I've suggested in the report for consideration by the board is that the actual the Innovation Park Medway is ranked highest um, and that's due to uh, great jobs being created through that project, uh, followed by, by Charleston Access Road. So it'd be those two projects that would receive funding first, and then Princess Alexander Hospital would be the project that's next in line for funding if additional funding became available for an existing project not being able to proceed. So this is very much a draft ranked list for the board's consideration. So the recommendation here is, yeah, those two top projects, the Innovation Park Medway and the Charleston Access Road, mm -hmm are the first to proceed. And then we've got a ranked list of projects that then sit below that, that would be next in line to receive funding. Um, as I said, very much a ranked, uh, draft ranked list. Um, so for consideration by the board, I think that's all I was going to say as a way of instruction, Chair. So happy to hand over and take any questions. Thank you, Rhiannon. Councillor David Finch. Thank you, Chair. Just the, an observation on what's just been said. I note that the Princess Alexandra Hospital scored better than Medway, and therefore there is an argument that that should be uh, as a stronger project that should take precedent. Whilst I understand that the Medway project is one that is um, creating new jobs, I just need to understand how are we actually using the ranking of projects in terms of their viability and their scoring? And therefore, are we just putting that on one side in this instance in terms of decision making? Or actually, are we going to change the criteria by which we score projects? So that would be helpful to understand, please. Yeah, so the top three projects uh, is the Innovation Park Medway, the Charleston Access Road and the Princess Alexander Hospital. They all had very similar scores. The only was that the um, Innovation Park Medway was going to take an additional year before it started to see the benefits realised whereas the top two projects felt that they could start to deliver those earlier. Having said that on balance, unfortunately, the Princess Alexander Hospital, in the information that we received, it wasn't reporting any direct job creation from, from the investments. Um, and that's why we have positioned it lower. It's a case of we're gonna have to go back to government and ask for these projects to be included in the programme. And I think they'll very much look at what are the jobs that's gonna be created from this, considering that was their main objective around the funding. So I think the absence of any direct job creation, um, whether that's the case or not, but that was certainly in the information that we received, that's the justification that we've kind of moved things around. Chair, I don't have any problem with Rhiannon's answer on that, so fine. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Rodney Chambers and then Roger Goff. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I just want to bring you up to date. Um, just to ask Rian a, a question. These, um, the ranking was based upon the submissions that uh, were again submitted in early February. Am I right, uh, Rian? Yes, that's great. Yes. So um, the um, and were the, was the um, 
what I want to do today is just to bring members up um, with some information that we've now been able to bring um, the Innovation Park um, Medway forward in its um, in getting the contractors on site. Um, all the problem we had in the submission in February was that um, we were waiting for the clearance on the LDO from our partner local authority, which is because the site transcends two local authority areas, we had to get the LDO cleared by Tunbridge and Morling, which we did in February. Um, um, and since then, we've gone through the procurement um, process. We are going to make a decision on the 7th of April on those that have submitted to us. And instead of uh, uh, June, July having the contractor on site, we're now confident that we will now have the contractor on site um, in May. And had that information been taken into consideration, I believe that would change our overall ranking score. Uh, particularly in the area of procurement, um, I think you did an assessment of has the procurement exercise for the provider of the construction work taken place? Well, it hadn't at that time, it has now. So would that have changed the rating? Yeah, I think if we'd had that information, it would have, um, its, its technical score would have increased. So yeah, I think that reaffirms its position at the top of the rank list that's been proposed. Yeah, I think thank that's you. thank you. Thank you. So I've got Roger Goff and then David Finch. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just to say that I, I very much value both what we've just heard from Rodney and indeed from David before that, because I think uh, the information about the timing that Rodney described is important. But uh, I think David was right both to raise the question as to how we approach our scoring, uh, but also I think the sort of pragmatic approach which has been taken uh, uh, and the way Rhiannon has weighed up what particularly will be important with government. I think it makes a lot of sense. So I think uh, hopefully we're all very much in agreement on this. And I think a good sign that we could all try to focus on the projects that are really gonna deliver across the area. I mean, we, I, I entirely understand the interest in the Princess Alexandra Hospital, clearly from a narrowly Kent point of view, and just a little behind, you know, we're very, very keen on the Amelia Scott, uh, which scores well, but not quite as well, but uh, we think is a very, very important project. But I think the, logic of what's been applied here makes an enormous amount of sense and so I'm very, very glad to support both uh, Innovation Park Medway uh, and indeed Charleston. Thank you Roger. David Finch. Uh, Jim and I just want chair sorry I just wanted to say that I found Rodney's uh, explanation very helpful and I already said that I understood Rhiannon's points of view as well so I have absolutely no objection whatsoever with Medway going forward in place of um, Princess Alexander. Thank you. And Rihanna, can I just check when it comes to, you know, if it comes when it comes to accountability board, will those those things be updated within the documents? Absolutely. So yeah, following this uh, board meeting, the projects are going to prepare business cases. I understand the innovation part Medway is already looking at that business case. And um, you know, similarly with for the Charleston Access Road, that will come to the accountability board and, and you know go through the normal independent technical evaluation process to make sure we're you know, fully confident around uh, the delivery and, and the case for investment. Thank you. Just thought it was important to make that clear. Okay, great. So um, do we agree the prioritise getting building fund project pipeline um, as set out in table one of your papers? Oh, sorry, Graham Peters, do you have your hand up before we go to that? Sorry, I didn't see it. I was just going to thank colleagues for their support for the Charleston Road and invite them to, when we're all allowed out again, to come and visit this gem of the East Sussex visitor economy. It's a very important part of it and they're hugely activist in getting that economy going again. So very grateful for colleagues' uh, support for this particular proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. And having driven down that road, I couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, so apropos what I just said, are we... Uh, do we agree that uh, getting bu building fund project pipeline in your papers? 
Agreed. Great. Thank you. Okay, now let's move on to um, item seven, which is an LDF update and spend beyond the growth deal period. Uh, Rhiannon, if I it's back. Sarah, oh, Jeff's sorry, waving. Jeff, are you waving? Sorry. Uh, just, just on that, um, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank Rhiannon for all the work that she's done uh, over this and and over the last few years. Um, the news is I know that she's moving and you know our loss is Surrey's gain. And I, I think the board would appreciate. And I think today what we've just seen is uh, an example of, of just how she's helped us get through so many of the projects and uh, and, and be successful in our delivery uh, program. So certainly on behalf of Kent and Midway, I'd like to uh, thank you, Rhiannon, and wish you the very best in Surrey. And uh, I should be sticking a, dole in, a needle in the dole of Surrey just because it's, it's the wrong, yeah, from, from our point of view, but uh, well done and thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I know that uh, that absolutely everybody on this board would would endorse that. I am sure, um, but we're not letting you get away net yet, quite yet, Rianne. And you're going to do the next item on the agenda on uh, on the LGF, um, and I know you're going to be around for a little bit longer. And I know also that you always pay tribute to the rest of your team that's doing all of the work behind the scenes. So absolutely acknowledge that, but don't want you to to not. Uh, not recognise how much we particularly appreciate you as well. So anyway, let's go on to the LGF. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. And yeah, uh, my last update on local growth funds. Um, so the programme is nearing an end. Uh, it is due to finish at uh, the end of this month, the local growth fund. The board has previously agreed an extension of six months. Any projects that are going beyond that six month extension, that kind of blanket approval, they require additional approvals from this board to make sure we're comfortable with the deliverability of those projects and you know, things are progressing and, and they remain priorities. Um, so we've now got 18 projects that are going to spend or forecasting spend beyond that revised 30th of September 2021 date. There's an additional two projects that are covered in this report um, which are seeking that extension. Uh, that's the Grey Staff project and the Colchester Grow on Space project. Uh, the Colchester Grow on Space project, that spending beyond the growth deal period, mainly because it's only recently received a funding approval by the Accountability Board. So that was agreed in February, uh, just gone. Uh, so the, the delivery program is going to extend beyond that time scale, but we are fairly confident around that. We've now got planning for the project and um, it's progressing you know, as planned. The other project, the Grey South project, uh, this is always a large investment and the timescales are always very tight on this. There have been delays with uh, the work with, by Network Crow on this project as well as um, in relation to the acquisition of land. I think due to COVID, there's been some complications and um, sensitivities around acquiring sites at this time. So the boards asked in this report just to agree the extension of spend for those two projects. Um, that does, again, increase the amount of spend we're forecasting beyond um, the growth deal period quite considerably. So obviously there have been ongoing commitment around resource to um, oversee the monitoring and evaluation of these projects. The majority of, if not all, the funding will be transferred by the end of this financial year across to local authorities. Uh, but there are ongoing requirements that you know the projects are obviously delivered, um, and the board will continue to receive updates on, on the delivery of those projects um, as they proceed. Um, I think there's still a few high risk projects as well in, in the uh, programme. So we have transferred money across to partners, but they are with some specific conditions to ensure that they actually are delivered um, beyond the growth deal period. I think an important activity for me before I go um, is to look at the lessons learned through the program. Uh, where could we have done more to make sure we were spending earlier in the program? How could we have um, kind of mitigated some of the risks earlier and maybe taken some of the difficult decisions earlier in the program to enable other investments to come forward um, within the timescales? We've done an initial desktop look at this, and I think some of the causes, you know, as as we were kind of spoken about at Kansas Bids Board meetings, they do relate to. You know, some of the delays from third party organisations, central government departments. Covid's obviously had an impact, um, particularly funding uh, packages maybe falling away or total project costs increasing. Um, and I think as well, one importantly to look at is just where we've got overly ambitious programmes that have been set out in business cases. You know, how can we get something that's more realistic going forward? 
So um, we'll come back with a lessons learned report where we can look at, you know, where are the lessons that we can learn from the LGF, particularly for the Getting Building Fund or whatever comes next. Um, so just kind of draw your attention to that, that area of work we're going to look at next. Um, I think that was all I was going to mention, so happy to take any questions. Thank you, Rhiannon. And just to emphasise, the Accountability Board felt it was really important that we did do that lessons learned document and, and particularly um, so we have a really strong evidence base to show government um, that it's some of these things are not always within our control um, and to, to continue to, to look at how we can do things better. So right on to the conversation about these LGF. Um, Claire Lewis, do you have a where you got your hand raised? Oh, is that an old hand? Old hand. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments or queries? Uh, Rob Gledhill. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just on the Great South um, application and the part into the lessons learned. Um, if I compare the conversations officers are having now with Network Rail than what they were having maybe two, three years ago. Um, we're in a completely different place. Network Rail are more engaging now. We're, we're doing, you know, having really good conversations with them, but their processes are still incredibly slow. Um, I certainly don't blame the officers of Network Rail for that. They have a, a process. It's not just Thurrock, it's not just Essex, it's not just Stellet. It is for like, the nation, it's in the title. Um, but we, we are moving forward. But I think, uh, again, this, this links in quite nicely with the lessons learned about what's in our control and what's not. Mm -hmm. So where, where we might have an expectation that things are going to be delivered within time, um, it doesn't take an awful lot of process elsewhere, for want of a better term, um, that's going to slow us down, which is pretty much what we've seen uh, here. Um, and not just with the going underneath the um, railway lines, there's also the knock-on problems of, uh, as outlined by Rianne, and the uh, property purchases as well. Um, you know, again, it's not as easy as people may imagine of, okay, we just like buy a property and that's it. It's, as we know, there's a, a lot more that goes to it than that. Um, and we do really try to avoid the compulsory purchase order process be just because it is such a time consuming uh, process to take um, should it not be uh, working and obviously be required by the local authority looking at 18 months two years minimum uh, rather than having a sit down conversation with people and being sensible and, and purchasing a property um, and getting on with the job but again if you can't sit down and talk with people about this and uh, you know there are other uh, issues there as well then you kind of uh, have to expect that elongation of, of the process before you actually can put spades in the ground as it were Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Graham Peters. Yes, I just wanted to emphasise really what Rob's just said and uh, what Rhiannon was alluding to. Um, I think uh, local planning authorities so often get the blame for slow process and development. And actually, I think there are so many other bodies and other government departments uh, who have a hand in this, not least the utilities in some cases, but organisations like Network Rail. Every opportunity we get to bang on government's door and say, can you put dynamite under some of these other organizations and some of your departments uh, should be taken, um, uh, every opportunity should be taken and used. Thank you. A rant, but um, <laughs> I think a terribly important rant. We, it's so delaying, uh, so many developments just get stalled by so many of these other departments and businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. And that is part of the point of the power of the partnership. So uh, yes, thank you. Okay. So I can't see any other raised hands for queries on this. So I'd just like to, to move to vote on whether we agree the LGF spend beyond the 30th of September, 2021, the two following projects, Grays, South, Thurrock and Koch to grow on space, Essex. I see you. Great, thank you. And we need to note the cancellation of the Basildon Innovation Warehouse project from the LGF programme. Now I see that uh, Chris has rejoined the meeting. So I'm going to hand the baton of chairship over back over to him. Chris, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry I was late. Um, and I believe you're now on item eight. The That's support correct. Funds. Correct. Yeah. Okay, great. So, Sarah, thank you very much for uh, deputising uh, for me, uh, and I apologise once again for being somewhat late for the meeting this morning. 
So item eight, um, these are the sector support fund endorsements. Uh, and I'd like to hand over to Adam to, uh, to briefly introduce them, uh, the item on, uh, on carbon sequestration. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Chris. Um, welcome to the meeting. Um, just thank just a, a short one then from me on the latest sector support, uh, sector support fund project to come to the board. Um, you will note this obviously has got um, support from the ITE. This is a project um, around, as Chris said, carbon sequestration, which is the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and really, I, I guess in summary, what this project is seeking to do is, is to really raise the game a little bit on this important agenda. It'll look at demand from um, that's been identified in local plans um, and investigate that have a look at readiness for delivery, see if there's an overall sellup shaped offer or a sellup geography shaped offer that can be taken forward. Um, there is a talk in the, in the project bid around putting together a, a brokerage hub, which would seek to, to fill gaps in skills, knowledge and capacity that stands in the way of, of businesses moving forward with the agenda and really bring together local authorities and, and businesses to, to, to really move forward in, in the whole carbon offsetting space. Um, so what we're looking for the board to do today is supply its endorsement um, for investment in this project. Um, all the details are obviously in the paper and written by people who are much more expert in this area than perhaps you might already be able to tell that I am. Um, and we know that this comes with the the uh, support of uh, certainly three of, of our four federal areas. And I think um, what one one of the federal areas has, has asked a few questions of the project, which we'll, we will ensure are answered um, over, the, over the fullness of time as well. Um, as goes with the rest of uh, the sector support fund investments, you know, one of the things that I'm keen for us to do as much as we can over the course of this coming year is make sure that we report back to the board on um, delivery um, and you're clear on you know what these investments have done um, and what we've been able to push forward which is something that you know applies to this project in the same way it does to, to the other ones that we've supported in the past and thanks Chris that was uh, okay that was all I wanted uh, to say so Perias your hand is up uh, if you, uh, if you yeah yeah, thank, yeah yeah thanks chair um just leading on from what Adam said we were the uh, the OSC was the one federated area um, raised the questions. We were supportive of the principle what could be delivered, but questioned the directness of the link between the funding and achieving the outputs described in the business case. And we've put a number of questions to Adam. It doesn't say that we um, wouldn't vote in favour of it today, because clearly we will. Um, but just flag up, Adam, that it was the OSC that had the, the, a number of questions. In fact, it was um, the one question we put to the board that received the greatest number of responses we've ever had. Um, and Rob, uh, I know, is nodding away there. And uh, I think Pauline got the sort of deluge with comments back on it. I think, you know, it probably reflects the seriousness of the issue that was, was put in the paper. So we are supportive, but it'd be useful to get the answers to the questions back at some time, Adam, if, uh, if you could uh, feed that back to OSC, I would be grateful for that. Thanks, Perry. I mean, might I suggest that we invite the project promoter to, you know, on the basis that we push forward with this, that we invite them to to give us five, ten minutes at the next board meeting to really explain the project and the impact that we expect they will have. That would be very helpful. I'm sure Rob would agree. I'll let Rob uh, speak for himself, but I'd, I'd represent the OSC. I would be OK with that. Uh, you, Rob, you've got your hand up, I can see. Councillor Gladhill. Yeah, thanks um, for that, Chris. And um, it's just really to echo what Perry said. Yeah, th this is a, a, a good idea, but there are some significant questions I think <clears throat> um, need to be answered to be able to give that confidence that this is a, a really good spend and, and use of time and money. Um, you know, the, the, uh, as an example, the idea that 50 companies will put £10,000 in each um, for this, I, I can't see why they wouldn't, but equally I can't see why they would. Um, and not knowing, you know, sufficient enough about the, you know, the, their approach as to whether that would be successful or not, gives me that hesitancy. I mean, it's, again, it gets back to a fantastic idea. Um, it did annoy everybody that I was in that particular meeting with, with my phone pinging literally every, every other minute, I think, 
uh, with responses from um, other members of OSE. So I think definitely, uh, as uh, Jess suggested, that we do need to have them uh, in for uh, five, 10 minute presentation and, and question answering, just because I, I, so I, I wouldn't want to lose an opportunity like this um, just based on assumptions, um, because we all know what an assumption or uh, when you assume something is. Um, and I, I just feel, you know, if, if this is the right thing, we've got CPUP coming forward, as, as Perry pointed out in our um, uh, uh, email exchanges, and um, whether this is the right thing, and if it is the right thing, that, um, that it definitely gets the right level of support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Bedhill. Are there any other questions or observations on this topic? I can't see any. So, um, if uh, I mean, I th on the basis that um, Adam will respond or arrange for responses to the OSC uh, uh, questions, are, uh, is the is the board happy to endorse the recommendations uh, and on page twenty two of the pack and endorse the investment in the accelerating nature based climate solutions of one hundred thirty five thousand people? Happy to endorse that. Good. Okay, then I think that is endorsed. Thank you. In that case, we'll move to um, item nine, which is the delivery plan and update, uh, which I'll hand over to uh, our Chief Operating Officer, Suzanne. Suzanne. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, there's a few things that I want to update um, board on today. So we have the um, proposed delivery plan for 21-22. I want to give you a very brief update on how we're going against the current year's delivery plan for um, quarter three. So um, up to the end of December of last year, a brief update on the KPIs, risks, and also provide you some information around our annual performance review. I will keep it fairly brief though, because there's quite a few things on that list. Um, so the delivery plan for 21-22 has been drafted for your consideration. It is based upon the operational um, priorities that the board agreed um, at your December meeting. We have included um, some information on things that have moved since December. So we've got an update in there around the free ports allocations. And I've also included where we're going to need to resource the work around the LEP review. Um, that was pretty much all I was going to give you um, on the delivery plan for next year. Um, all the information is obviously there in the pack. Um, so in addition to the delivery plan for next year, provided an update on Q3 against current year delivery plan, we pretty much um, were in line with what we were expecting, um, which isn't surprising as we did actually update the delivery plan for this year at the beginning of Q3. So I'd be surprised if we were wildly different from it at that point. Um, so everything for current year is proceeding as we were expecting. Um, the KPIs, obviously there's a number of different um, categories of KPIs that we collect and within the appendix you can see where we've updated where we've got new information on the macroeconomic KPIs there's a considerable lag between um, <clears throat> these KPIs being updated at the level that we need it to be able to consolidate it across our region um, but we will update as that comes I mean, the, what the KPIs are telling us there is what we would be expecting obviously unemployment is rising um, but that has been cushioned somewhat by the interventions from central government around job, um, job retention scheme etc um, and um, we will continue to watch those KPIs very carefully and update board on where the movement happens there. And they will also be used to inform the delivery and action plans that we're gonna be developing that will sit alongside the recovery and renewal strategy that you considered earlier on the agenda. Um, there's no major variances or exceptions to report on the other KPIs. I mean, I think it was interesting that um, we got completely out of whack on our virtual AGM. We thought that we'd have less uh, attendees. We actually had more attendees this year virtually than we did in person. And then that is informing how we're thinking about how we might operate in future as, um, as restrictions reduce. We don't want to lose the good things that we've gained over the past year, and I think we will definitely be looking to um, increase our virtual uh, virtual events. And obviously it was really interesting, the platform that um, Louise is looking at for the skills events in July. Um, and, you know, personally, I think it's really, um, really good that we're actually, it feels like we're a bit more transparent. People, members of the public can definitely um, call in and see these meetings and watch them on YouTube. So um, that was an interesting point. Uh, 
there's some information on the risk register that we've included. This was pulled together in February, so there has been some movement since, um, since these risks were reported to Accountability Board in February. Obviously, at that point, COVID infection rates were sky high across our region. They have fallen now, and so those risks are being mitigated nationally, effectively, by the actions of government. Um, the main risk I probably would flag is the risk around the next tranche of GBF payment. We still haven't had confirmation of when we're going to receive the other half of our GBF payment. Um, it is dependent on the outcome of the annual performance review, which I'm going to give you a quick update on in just two seconds. But we're not actually expecting that until May. And that is causing some issues for us. It causes issues uh, making legal agreements. Obviously, people um, are reluctant to enter into legal agreements when we can't give them assurances about the future funding. Um, so um, it's an unfortunate situation where government really wants us to move very, very quickly, but their own actions, again, um, are creating delays. And we have to have a lot of conversations with people about why we can't give them full assurance around the funding because government won't provide us that assurance until partway into the next financial year. Um, so the annual performance review was held um, in February this year and um, for the new board members we have an annual performance review uh, each year. This year was a light touch review. They've changed the approach um, slightly where we still have three categories on which we're assessed, delivery, strategy and governance. Um, in previous years, the strategy assessment had been binary. We either were meeting their requirements or not. The other um, categories were effectively graded. In this year, it was moved to a simple meets requirements, not met sort of binary assessment on all three categories. As I say, we haven't had our final confirmation on that, but what we've heard back on um, the initial assessment and the verbal updates that we've had back is that we do meet requirements across all three categories. Um, they're going through a moderation sort of process at the moment where they look across all the LEPs across the country um, and we wait for the final confirmation in May, and we will um, write out to all board members to let them know what that assessment is when it comes in. So that's my very quick trip through all things operational delivery um, wise and happy to take any questions. So any questions or observations for, uh, for Suzanne? I think you're gonna get away with it, Suzanne. <laughs> okay. Oh yes, Sarah. <laughs> just a well quite. done. Oh, yes, not, exactly. not to get away with it. Just a well <laughs> yep. done. Yeah, exactly. Thing, because Sarah. I know it yep. actually. Yep. You know, it looks all amazing on on paper and easy, but I know that actually it's a lot of hard work. All yep. your your it's it might be swan like, but I'm sure you're paddling like mad. Yeah, <laughs> quite right, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. In that case, uh, we need to um, uh, agree to uh, formally adopt the delivery plan for. Uh, 21, 22, um, as set out in the Appendix A, uh, et cetera. So I'll be happy to do that. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, you can't go, Suzanne, because uh, you're uh, on item 10, which is the, um, uh, the show, uh, service level agreement with the accountable body. Uh, so perhaps you can just take us through that. Certainly, thank you, Chair. So um, as Everybody is aware Essex County Council acts as the accountable body for um, the South East Local Enterprise Partnership has done since the uh, CELEP was set up. We have a very good, very, um, very good working relationship with our accountable body. Effectively, this service level agreement formalises what is already there and what has been happening for the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, it was a recommendation from Essex County Council's internal audit that we should have a service level agreement in place just to formalise that relationship. Um, this is not a legally binding document. There isn't money changing hands from CELEP Limited to the accountable body because, as you know, the, all the finances sit within um, Essex County Council. So, in effect, it's a sort of a memorandum of understanding that just sets out the roles and responsibilities and really the relationship between the accountable body and the secretariat to um, a large degree. Suzanne, um, sorry, could I just jump in yep. and just say we've got a declaration of interest on this item for Councillor Finch. Okay, <laughs> thank oh, you. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, yep. yeah, thank you. That's noted and will be noted uh, appropriately. So for Councillor Finch, thank you. Thank you. And uh, and Graham, I think, Graham Butland, I think yes. your hand is up. I, I, as, a, as a member of Essex County Council. Of course, thank you. 
So that declaration is also noted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to go into the detail of the SLA, but if there were any questions or um, any points of clarification that board needed, I am happy to um, take those now. So any questions or observations for Suzanne on the shared, uh, on the service level agreement? No, is everyone happy to um, agree to enter that uh, service level agreement with Essex County Council? Everyone happy? Oh, uh, Perry, is your hand? Oh, if your hand's up. Yeah, only, 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 oh, yeah. Only, one, only one question, Chair. I know it was, yes. um, uh, and probably should know this actually, but uh, Suzanne, you said no money changes hands, but is there an amount of money we pay Essex to do the work for us that uh, is, is noted within the accounts? So there is, um, there is an amount of money that um, goes to Essex County Council, so £110,000. Um, that, when I say no money changes hand, I mean so there's no money that comes from CELEP Limited directly as a sure. company sure. to Essex County Council, which so there's no consideration on this particular documentation because of CELEP Limits, Limited holds no money themselves. Yeah, so it's okay, an internal but, um, transaction, yeah, okay. but there but is we, a payment. There's a payment of 110 from CELEP yeah. to Essex. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Perry. So um, just to go back, and we do have to uh, agree, make that agreement. So is everyone happy to agree to enter in the service level agreement? Thank you. Okay, that's done. Um, now, um, I understand uh, I'm a somewhat disadvantaged here because I think um, this is, goes back to an item that might have been previously partly covered in the board. Do we still have, Adam, perhaps you can help me here. Do we still have some, uh, some business around uh, co-opted uh, directors to approve? We do, Chris. Yeah. So, right. so the conversation we had earlier, we, we covered the, the rest of the items on item three, but yep. because obviously uh, you did previously indicated as a chair of the board that you would want to be present for the discussion on, on nomination of co-ops for the coming yes. financial year. Yes. Okay. That's great. So um, I think what we need to do is there are um, a, a, a number of individuals uh, who have been um, put forward for uh, to be co-opted. Uh, they are Councillor uh, Trevor Bartlett, uh, Professor Karen Cox, uh, Angela O'Donoghue and Penny Shimon. Uh, and I believe also Councillor Graham Butland as well. Is that, that's correct? Okay, so could I, if I could ask those uh, individuals uh, perhaps to, um, to, to, <laughs> to, to, uh, Go on. Uh, I don't know what. How, how can we do this? Could they uh, on, on Zoom? I was going to ask them to leave the room, but that's clearly that's not appropriate. <laughs> Suze can come in there. And yeah, yeah, that, okay. that's yeah, fine. So um, we will ask um, if um, we are going to virtually <laughs> escort <laughs> um, <laughs> Karen, Councillor Butland, um, Angela, and uh, Penny out of the room. You don't need to do anything. Just sit tight. We're going to put you on hold, and then we'll bring you bring you back in. So yeah, if you just bear with us one second chair and we'll do that now oh sorry i've got people moving um where are we let me just check i'm sorry we're still sorry i can't <laughs> there we go we're good thank you amy sorry i couldn't people kept moving around and i couldn't see them thank you we're, we are all okay now okay thank you so um the first one on my list is uh, Councillor uh, Trevor Bartlett, who is the leader of Dover Council, who uh, to, and we've um, he's been put forward to serve as a director of the Southeast uh, Limited for a period of twelve months from the first of April, twenty twenty one. So, uh, do I don't know if people need an explanation or any. Uh, this is basically um, part of a deal that was done. Uh, last year, uh, where we uh, district councils, um, uh, we, we are able to have two on our board uh, out of this, and um, it was agreed that, um, that Kent and Essex would be um, uh, able to nominate, uh, respectively, local district uh, councillors to be the co-ops. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, uh, normally it would have been uh, East Sussex's turn. Uh, to uh, to have a, um, a a nomination, but because of the importance of uh, Britain's uh, leaving the European Union and the effect on ports and logistics, it was felt that it was more appropriate for Essex to have an additional year uh, for this year. But that uh, and uh, clearly, uh, Councillor uh, Bartlett is from is from Dover, which of course is one of the areas that is uh, is very uh, heavily affected. So that was the reason for uh, Councillor Bartlett's nomination. 
from Kent. Uh, so all in favor? Thank you. I think that's pretty unanimous. So that's great. So the next one I have on the list is, uh, is Councillor Graham Butland, who is the representative from, uh, has been nominated by Essex, the District Council from Essex. Um, and uh, can I ask for votes in favor? Great, thank you very much. Oh. That's, that's done. Graham had his hand up. Oh, Graham, you've got your hand, Graham, sorry, you've got your hand up. Excuse yeah, so, me. So yeah, before, before, before Yep. I don't, don't want to make a, major, a drama out of a crisis, but uh, East Sussex uh, very much stood aside in order to allow representatives from two ports to come forward. I'm delighted that Trevor Bartlett's come forward from Dover. Um, however, we received notification of Graham Butland's uh, proposal too late to be, to be discussed by the Team East Sussex board, um, which is a pity. Uh, most of us know Graham, we value his expertise, um, and he's already given valuable input this morning. But unless they teach geography very differently in Essex than they do in East Sussex, Braintree uh, is a very long way away from Harwich. Um, uh, Graham's sleep isn't troubled by the mournful sounds of foghorns, but by the tweeting of, uh, of the dawn chorus and the tweeting of the wild birds of Essex. Um, in our view, uh, if it wasn't possible to find an appropriate representative from the port district of Tendring, then perhaps the position should have been offered back to East Sussex for a representative from our rather smaller port, New Haven. That would have been a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, I've now got a rather challenging task on my hands because I've got to persuade my borough and district colleagues that Celep and I acted in good faith when we gave up our slot uh, to a port representative earlier on in the year. Um, however, I've just made our discontent clear and I want to put down, if I may, a very strong marker that it should be East Sussex's turn definitely next year. Uh, I don't see much purpose in uh, trying to overturn Graham Butland's nomination at this stage, uh, despite some colleagues' kind support for our position. Um, so I genuinely hope Graham is listening and he'll be able to go on a steep learning curve um, at the port of Harwich so that he can accurately represent what's going on there learn about the ships and the sea and listen to some mournful fod foghorn. So very happy to uh, support it in these circumstances, but um, you've heard my discomfort. Yes, thank you. That is, uh, I think that is a nice is... drink when I have to take it to the team. Yes, Sussex board. sure. Uh, I think Councillor Finch would like to make an observation in response. Uh, David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. I think uh, um, what's already been said about the capability of Graham Butland as a leader of Braintree District Council, which is not that far from Harwich, actually. And if the distance for the leader of Tendring to Harwich is probably about the same distance from Braintree to Harwich, actually. But the important point is Graham leads one of the most thrusting and economic areas within North Essex and actually has very good relationship with Neil Stock, the leader of Tendring. I took the um, liberty of writing to Neil Stock on the issue of the Freeport representation, uh, as has been already mentioned. And indeed, um, Neil has come back with, with a letter which has come through the Chief Executive of Tendering, which fully supports Graham to be that representative of the Freeport, which let's remember that Freeport is in Harwich and in Felixstowe, which is in Suffolk as well. And so um, Neil fully endorses Graham to be the representative on behalf of him on the Freeport's issue. I'm sure given his intellect and his capability, Graham will be um, a superior brain in absorbing and understanding all of the nuances and issues and opportunities that exist with the Freeport's as they develop in Essex and in Suffolk and indeed in the country as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I think I will allow uh, Graham to make one response to that and then um, we'll uh, put it to a vote. I want to make an observation as well, actually more general observation. Uh, Graham, you're on mute. Thank, yeah. thank you for that reassurance, David. Um, anyway. Enough okay. said. Okay. Okay. With Graham. No, the, the, the with one, another the one, Graham. It's, great. Yeah. it's a great Christian name. <laughs> yeah. The one, the one observation I would make is that, um, uh, as I hope people are aware, uh, we are under a, an obligation, I think Suzanne will correct me if I get this wrong, to uh, achieve gen gender parity on the board uh, of CELEP by, uh, is it by March 23, Suzanne? Yeah. By March 23. 
Um, I would observe that uh, all the local authority representatives, that's the, uh, the upper tier uh, representatives, and indeed now the two corps, as has been the case last year as well, are all, uh, are all uh, obviously all white middle-aged men. And um, what they, the thing I, I, I can't uh, and wouldn't want to interfere with the democratic process, of course, with, because the electors will elect whoever they will and, uh, and uh, local authorities must nominate whoever they will to the board. I would just make the observation that if uh, the local authorities persist in, uh, in nominating a 100% a slate of men, it makes the, uh, the task to achieve gender parity across uh, the select board steeper for those um, for, for, for the others. So, for example, if the eight upper tiers, uh, uh, upper tiers plus uh, districts are all men out of 25, it means that uh, the, 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 uh, in order to achieve gender parity for the balance, uh, I think you have to get to 60, 65 percent, whatever the arithmetic is, is uh, for gender. So um, I would just make that observation and leave it, leave it at that before, uh, unless people want to uh, think that I've got this completely wrong. But um, uh, it does make, you know, if local authorities continue to nominate only men, uh, it makes the uh, it makes the the task of achieving gender parity in the remainder of the board uh, more of a steep slope. That's all. Okay, uh, shall we put? Uh, I don't think we put Graham Butland's um, uh, nomination to a option to the uh, to the board. So please, could I have your votes in favour? Thank you. Any against? No. Okay, so that's great. That's, so Graham has been duly uh, elected. Um, the next one is um, so the next one is the HE, the higher education representative. So that is Professor Karen Cox. Does anyone have any comments to make or observations? No. So can I put that to the vote then, please? All in favour? Perfect. Thank you. And then. Uh, uh, Angelo Donahue, who is the further education representative. So Angelo is all well known to you all. Everyone happy to vote in favor? Thank you. Uh, and then um, finally, uh, but not, not, not least, uh, Penny Shimon as the, um, the third sector representative. Great, okay, that's great, perfect. Um, so in that case, um, uh, we can invite um, uh, the uh, the candidates uh, back uh, to the room. Um, if we can do that, Suzanne. Yep, we're just doing that now. Just takes them a second to come back through. We should just see them joining now. Perhaps we could give them an update on the vote because I don't think they can yes. hear us. Uh, let, well, Suzanne, they're back in. Look. Yep, I think we have everybody's back in. Yes. Okay, then Suzanne, could you report on the the, the votes then, please? Um, yes, certainly. So for um, the four members of the board who have just joined us, all of the recommendations for the appointment of the co-ops um, have been agreed by board. So you are all with us for another 12 months. So thank sure you very much for your <laughs> thank you very much for your service. It is much, much appreciated. OK, we're on to um, I think we're on to in that case, any other business. Um, and I think there are some some very important Thank yous. Uh, so first, uh, in, in, in no order, but uh, first that uh, we understand that uh, Councillor Finch is not standing for re-election in the forthcoming local elections. Uh, so um, we will want to put on thank our thanks on to him on record for his critical contribution to CELEP uh, over the last uh, of the last year or two. So uh, David, from me and I hope from the board. Uh, a very sincere thank you for all you've done uh, over the course of the last uh, year and a bit. Uh, and it's been, um, maybe it's, it's two years, I think, actually. So thank you so much for, for all of that. Uh, it is most heartfelt and we wish you well in whatever you decide to do next. Secondly, um, if uh, I'd like to uh, thank um, Councillor David Monk, uh, who uh, will no longer be the Kent uh, District Co-op uh, co moving forward, as we've just uh, uh, welcomed in Councillor Trevor Bartlett. So again, David, thank you so much for all you've done. It's very, very helpful, and uh, we again wish you wish you well. I, I, I assume you're continuing to stand as you're continuing to have your council involvement. So um, best wishes with that. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to wish uh, all of the, uh, the candidates for in the local elections uh, the very best of luck in the upcoming uh, local elections. 
And then finally, I think it's already been said by Sarah, but I would uh, like to make sure that the board rec recognize the huge uh, thanks that uh, to Rhiannon and her team, uh, sorry, Rhiannon from uh, the Capital Projects team who is moving to Surrey County Council. Uh, Rhiannon's development at Celup has, uh, has, um, has, she's done wonderful things for us. She's always uh, in sometimes quite difficult circumstances, always come through with grace and professionalism. So I wanted to thank uh, Rhiannon in particular, certainly for me personally, but also on behalf of the, on behalf of the board. And we'd like to wish her the very best in her new endeavours with, uh, with Surrey County Council. And uh, good luck with the M25, Rhiannon. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, are there any other, any other business items that people would like to, to raise? Uh, hey, David, uh, Dave. Yes, David, I can see your hand waving. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to thank you and Sarah and indeed the, and Adam and also all the officers as well. And also to the members of this board as well for what I've seen as a very fair and balanced conversation about the projects that we've had to deal with and to actually to wish you all well into the future and may you drive the economy of Essex, Kent and England up the chain so that we are indeed the powerhouse of Europe and indeed eventually the powerhouse of the world as well. So good luck and thank you all again. Thank you, David, very much. And David Monk, I think you wanted to. Well, I've got to, uh, I've got to echo that, haven't I? It's uh, <laughs> been a, 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 a grand experience. I must admit it's much easier to come to the meetings virtually. <laughs> Indeed. Well, that's uh, that's an important uh, uh, an important point that we need to ponder on as to how we do these things going forward. But certainly, for me personally, it's much easier sitting here in my home uh, in uh, in Sutton Valence in Kent rather than uh, having to, uh, to to battle with the Dartford crossing to Perfleet. But <laughs> we'll have that debate in due course. Um, the other thing I should do, I think it would be remiss of me uh, not to say a word or two about the the reason I was late this morning. Um, uh, I believe that Adam has already given you a brief update as to uh, where the things stand on the LEP review. Uh, the reason I was late was because um, I was attending a, a, I sit on, as I, most of you know, I sit on the, the national uh, board for, there are eight of us LEP chairs who sit on the national board of the LEP network. And um, we have been um, just going through um, uh, the, the terms of reference for uh, the LEP review, which was announced in, in the budget um, by the Chancellor a, a, ten, a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm glad to report that um, the progress on the terms of reference is, um, is good. Uh, they, I, we believe that the terms that we hope that the terms of reference will go in the, uh, the minister, the relevant minister's boxes um, uh, today for his, for their approval. Um, uh, just very, very briefly, um, the, uh, this is talking about the evolution of, of LEPs over the course of uh, over, over the course of probably the coming coming year. Uh, the the if if the terms of reference are agreed by the minister, uh, the process is that um, the, the review will start immediately. Uh, that uh, the process uh, should uh, be concluded. Uh, the review should be concluded by the uh, the summer recess, so that ministers can have the advice from the review. Uh, for when Parliament uh, reopens uh, in uh, in September, uh, and we hope that a decision uh, on those recommendations will be made at that time, with the expectation that if there are to be any changes, and I think there will be, uh, that those will be put in place for the uh, for the financial year 22-23. Um, we have to recognise that there's important work on the capital programmes and other and other things that we're doing, which mustn't be. Uh, distracted uh, by the review, so we want to make sure that this board uh, is um, is focused on the delivery of uh, the plan that we've just approved for 21-22, and uh, and not be distracted um, by um, what goes on. Um, the 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 direction of travel is very much um, evolution uh, of the LEPs. Uh, clearly, uh, they, they will have we will have uh, less. To do with capital programs going forward, uh, certainly in the immediate to to in the immediate to medium term. However, there is um, what we do in relation to innovation, uh, what we do in relation to, to clean growth, what we do in relation to skills, how we relate to how we give advice to ministers about what's going on on the ground in uh, in our areas is um, is uh, bit vitally uh, appreciated um, by by ministers. I suspect if you were to ask me to guess what would happen, 
I think uh, we'll probably move more towards bays uh, and we'll pr probably be more in tune with um, the bays, maybe DIT uh, genders and rather less so with MHCLG, if, if you were to ask me to, to bet, but clearly that's just speculation on my part. And um, I think there could be, there, there should be a, an exciting future for LEPS, but it will, it will change and it will be, and it's not, a, it's not by any means a commentary on what, uh, uh, on the on the quality of what LEPS have done or do in the past, it's really because there's a change of policy. Uh, ministers have changed, and ministers have different priorities. And uh, and and as with any public service institution, I've been involved with a few over the last uh, ten years or so. Uh, we're always in a constant state of change, and I think this is just a natural order of things. Um, so I think it's uh, for me. Um, I think it's like there's an exciting future for LEPS. Uh, and uh, and the and the LEP network will be fully involved in the process, uh, as indeed will others. So I expect that um, the LGAs, uh, local local government associations, will have a will have input. The chambers and other business representative organisations will have an input, as indeed will the mayoral combined authorities, uh, over the course of the next few months um, around the review, uh, with the results being announced um, in. Uh, in uh, uh, the recommendations rather from the review being announced, but hopefully before the summer recess. Um, I can't share the terms of reference with you at this time because they haven't been agreed, but um, I do anticipate that once they are agreed that I will be able to do so. And hopefully that will be um, in the next uh, week or two. So I'm happy to take questions, but that's, that's where things stand at this time. Uh, yes, Roger, Councillor Goff. Thank you. Do you think that in the light of the shift towards Bayes and away from MHCLG, that the composition of the LEP will change further? I think I think there are a couple of things to say about that, Roger. I think that um, certainly I, I was, uh, I, I made the point uh, this morning that the links with local authorities are critical, I think. And so therefore um, I would hope that uh, those will be maintained and will be maintained strongly, but um, there are different views. There are different views on that particular topic. Mm -hmm. The other thing, uh, and I don't want to set too many hairs running, but and I think probably Celep to some extent is more insulated than others from this. But I do think that geography is uh, is certainly going to be a, a an issue. Uh, and the reason I say that I think Celep may be more insulated than others is because uh, I think the geographies, when I talk about geography, I think um, the Treasury in particular, but others as well, are keen for their not to have to deal with 38 different local growth uh, units, but a, a, lesser, a, a lesser number. So therefore, clearly, I mean, we're, we, we, as you know, as everyone knows, we're, we're probably the size of about four LEPs. And uh, so therefore, if, if there is to be change, uh, I would imagine that others will be more exposed to those changes than us, but we may not be immune. Uh, so geography, geography is uh, is certainly something that is it is going to be thought about uh, quite hard. And uh, there are the way that the the winds are blowing in Westminster and Whitehall, Whitehall in particular, uh, there will be a I think there's a desire to deal with fewer rather than more laps. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Any other? questions or observations. Uh, so, I, I mean, the good thing is that uh, from our perspective, I suppose, uh, maybe it's a good thing, is that uh, we, we have a ringside seat uh, because I'm on the, on the, on the network board. Uh, and to the extent that I'm able, uh, clearly uh, we'll, we'll want to try and keep this board informed as to how things are going. Uh, what I don't want to do is give, is give you um, updates um, uh, on, on, on negotiations because, uh, even what I've said, you know, could could change. The terms of reference have not yet been agreed, and clearly, once they are agreed, there will be a process, um, and there will be, uh, as with all processes, you know, people take negotiate negotiating stances, etc. Having said that, um, I do think that uh, the citizen local growth unit, um, who are the, obviously are driving it, it, this from an official point of view, uh, recognise that um, they need the help of the LEP network and any others to, 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 to get a sensible answer out of this. And therefore, um, so far, 
uh, they've been um, they've been very it's been a very collaborative and cooperative um, uh, process. So I'm I'm actually hopeful uh, uh, by the negotiations that have taken place over the last uh, ten days or so in getting the terms of reference uh, sorted that uh, that um, you know, we will be able to influence uh, how things how things go. But I mean, I think the critical next stage is for ministers to get involved and. Um, uh, I could speculate as to, I mean, there will be a, a minister uh, nominated to be in charge of this process. And um, uh, the, the, the candidate, who I probably shouldn't mention, but if it is the candidate that uh, is, is being talked about for, for being the relevant minister, I think that's going to be extremely favorable uh, for, um, for, for us. And he, he's, a, he's an individual who knows our neck of the woods very well. So that's, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, a hopeful. Uh, Celep is is different uh, to, <laughs> to most of the other LEPs for all the reasons you know very well. And uh, uh, that difference is, uh, is, is recognized certainly by the, by the, by the relevant minister. I hope, if it is who I think it will be, it's certainly going, it's going into his box tonight, for example. <laughs> so we'll see. Okay, um, I just look at the chat to make sure I've not missed anything. No, that's all. So if, if everyone's happy, then I think we should leave it there. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, and, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Chris. Thank Thanks, Sarah.